In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. I am your host, Ryan Roxy, and today is one of those days where I'm excited as you are to do the show and for you to listen to the show. If you are listening on uh, one of your favorite platforms, if it is YouTube, please subscribe to the channel right there at that little box right down below. If you're not and you're just uh, sitting in your car, what are you doing in your car? You're not supposed to be in your car these days. You're still supposed to be at home, right? But wherever you may be right now is a good day because I have on the show today we have pretty much the archetype for being in the trenches, I would say. A very inspiring guitarist. Um, He's made his living in the trenches, and we're going to talk about it. The ins and outs of of playing guitar professionally for most of your life. And that's pretty much what you do as uh, far as listeners. That's what you're inspired to uh, do. And hopefully we will give you some inspiration today. So uh, please help me welcome to the trenches mr pete thorn hello how you doing man great to see you what's going on pete i'm good man it's it's early here and late there i know so i'm I'm just starting on the coffee and uh just getting going and you're extreme you're extreme west coast right these days so um i'm in sweden our listeners know so we try and our producer is somewhere in between in arkansas so we uh, we try to uh always make it an international fair uh sort of post up at a good time and uh this sort of does it when we record these things it's 9 a.m for you 6 p.m for me but wherever we are you know as damone would say is the place to be there you go and, yeah yeah that's good I, as damone would say you know fast times are rich one high this right? is great <laughs> <laughs> well the thing is I was trying to think like what's my angle for this podcast because obviously you have a huge YouTube presence. You have 189,000 subscribers that already know about your history. They've already read your bio. So, and I and my crowd knows about you, but they might not know know you as a household name. They know the bands you play with definitely. But I was thinking, what's our angle? What's going to be our story? And I, I, we have to know each other somehow you know, through six degrees of separation, I guess you would say, but we have sure. definitely crossed paths at one point and we've never met, I, I would say personally, but I would say at, at some time we auditioned for the same band, right? Probably. <laughs> it's a funny, <laughs> it's a funny thing. I mean, I'm, I'm buddies with Glenn Sobel now. I mean, I know a lot of folks that, that, that you know, but, uh, and I've known about you for a long, long time. So it's, we, we, it could be one of those things where we met 20 years ago and you know what I mean? And we just well, the thing is out. you moved, you moved to Los Angeles in 1990 and that's, that's when cool. I moved back to Los Angeles for sort of my second stint. I was living in New York with a band called electric angels. Then I moved to LA and I just said, look, I'm going to play with as many people as possible. And I was always a sort of a one man band or one band man sort of guy. And I, I, I'd never played around with a bunch of different bands up until then. Then yeah. I just started playing with everybody. I just kind of hoard myself out. And that was part of my process of becoming uh, sort of a working musician and, and really starting to learn the ropes. So we're there at the same exact time. Yeah. Um, the person that I think might have had some sort of uh some sort of bond between us uh you first started uh, playing with rick parker because i used to record oh, in yeah. the sandbox and and uh, you were in a band called sparkler right or, or for and how did that work out or were, was that band something that you pursued or was it a yeah. short time that was the second band i got into in la wow that's cool that you uh <laughs> you brought up rick because he's a real um what a great guy and uh he's so so talented is so talented uh, this is a guy that I was really, really inspired by, by talk about a guy. I mean, he'd be a great guy to, to talk to. Maybe you've already had him on your show. I'm not sure, but no, no, no I haven't. Um, not, he'd not be yet. a great guy to talk to you. Cause I always remember Rick, he, he was like a, like a musical motivational guru. I mean, he was a songwriter and producer, but he was also this guy that went at the point I met him in 96, 
or so. I think he'd already had like five record deals or something by then with all these different bands that he. I was there when he got his first record deal with Lions and Ghosts. Lions and, and Ghosts. I, I was yeah. playing in a band called Candy, which evolved to Electric Angels, and it was right around that time. I think we we shared a lot of the same velveteen sort of outfits at that point. <laughs> you know, whether it was Jellyfish, Electric Angels, or or uh, Lions and Ghosts, we, there was a lot of velveteen going on in those years. But yeah. I, I remember that Rick had a studio called the sandbox it was sandbox. literally called a sandbox because it was a guest house that he had filled with sand the inner walls so yeah. to for the soundproofing and did you record at that studio when i met rick he was in i think the second incarnation of sandbox which was on sunset boulevard like right across from sunset marquee okay. or sorry not sunset marquee the uh, uh chateau marmont it was like okay. literally kind of across the street. And so that's where we recorded a bunch of the the demos and stuff that, uh, for Sparkler when I had joined the band. My stint with them was pretty short, but I made some lifelong friends. I mean, folks like Tommy Black, uh, you know, and, and we, we ended up playing, playing a handful of gigs and writing some songs. And then the band kind of disbanded after that, but we all stayed friends. And one of the things I loved about Rick was he was just always so relentlessly sort of positive. Um, I remember him saying, you know, in LA, man, there's a lot of guys and they grumble about this and they grumble about that and how hard it is and how tough it is to make it and stuff. And he's like, man, how are you ever going to get anywhere if you're a part of that crowd? You don't ever want to fall into that. You want to stay up here, man. Like always stay positive and just be like looking for the next thing. So he was just like this great, you know, inspiring dude. And the occurring theme stay that the, I just had Michael Monroe uh, on a few weeks ago on the podcast and he said, PMA positive mental attitude and you mm. hear it coming again you know yeah. that's that's great so rule one and I, I might borrow a quote from one of your episodes because I have been checking out uh, some of your episodes you have in your YouTube channel is that yeah. if you want to make it in the business of course positive mental attitude but don't be an asshole yeah don't be a yeah. jerk you know <laughs> Just, you can't because nobody you know how it you know you've you've spent uh, years on buses and uh, with the same group of people years at a time, right? Traveling around all over. And if right. there's one jerk in the group, it, you don't care how good they play, right? <laughs> it spoils the whole bunch. Yeah. I, well, isn't that one of the things? It's like everybody at, at a certain point knows how to play. If you're if you're exactly. going to call yourself a professional musician, you have to a certain level of, of uh, you know, just your fundamentals are covered. Proficiency. I would, then, say, I would say the playing, you got to be, you got to have to be able to play. Let's just get that out of the way. You have to be able to yeah. play the parts, no the sounds, and do the job. That's that's a given. Now, what does it take to actually get the gig and keep it? And it's about the hang. It's about you know, hang. I think we're both talking about the same thing. And, and, yeah. and I always say the people that you're playing with now, be cool to them. And, and try not to, you know, leave a band on musical differences, which is usually, you know, getting a fight about something stupid with the ego. So yeah. try not to try to be cool. Even if you guys do end up disbanding, be cool because they're going to help you at some point with your next gig. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. and the crew. I mean, it could be the uh, the monitor guy or, you know, the other guitar player's guitar tech or somebody, you know, they'll hear about a gig and then they'll be, hey, I he referred you for, you know, down the road. <laughs> but if you were a jerk to anybody, you know, it can hurt your chances later on. Of uh, and, and it's also just, you know, to get to get work and kind of further your career and all that's one thing. And then also just uh, not why be in a toxic environment on the road anyway? Like work, work to actively not, to not um, uh, fertilize that and make that happen. You know, no matter how bad it's it. Like sometimes, you know, I think about some of the tours I've done and stuff where it's kind of brutal travel or brutal schedule or whatever, and it can be tough and it can be real easy to go down the path of grumbling and kind of complaining and stuff. But when you're all in it together and everybody stays, well, you know, if you crack a joke or lighten it up a little bit or whatever people remember those people and that's like the kind of person when you're on your next gig maybe you've got a a, a better gig you know down the road or whatever and you'll think and they need a bass player or something you'll think oh yeah that guy in that band that guy was, was good he had a good attitude yeah yeah right. yeah well let's work with that guy like because you know how it is it's human nature to want to refer people and work with your friends and stuff uh and you want to get good people involved in the situation, you know, to make it easier on everybody, you know, right. and, you know whether it's the movie business, whether it's the music business, it kind of just, it flourishes out from that or whether it's politics, to be honest with you, everybody yeah. seems to like, you, 
it's true. And just go from their friends. You know, it's like you, you, you're first extended. And some, unfortunately, we have a lot of family working for everybody right now politically. But the, as far as like, you know, you keep a circle. And, and as long as yeah. that circle is cool for you and it works with you, then that's usually who you reach out to when it comes some time for work. And it's going to reflect back on you if you refer somebody and it works out. And it's also going to reflect back on you if you refer somebody and it doesn't work out so good. So, <laughs> well, you know. you're, you're coming from Edmonton. You're, you know, it's 1990. You were, you didn't know a whole bunch of people when you first came in. So you're kind of looking for that circle and trying to form it or form uh, some sort of musical family around you. This is another sort of thing that I thought about that maybe might have bonded us. Have you ever been called out on an edition by, by Barry Squire? Do you remember Many. this name? Many times. Many. Okay, Many. so that's something that 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 I think people that are aspiring to you know maybe move to Los Angeles or 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 move to a big city that has a music scene. There was a guy in Los Angeles. And I don't know. I, I you know I don't know where he is right this moment, but he was the guy that if you wanted to be in a band and get on a musical audition, you had to go through him. And his name was Barry Squire. And I actually got his name this morning because I was thinking about it, going. I need to know the name of that guy. I texted Nita Strauss and she was yeah. like, it, and we both came up with it. She said, I go, I think his name was start with a B Barry. And she texted back yeah. Squire. So when, so you went on some Barry Squire. Tell Sparkler, us about actually Rick's band was, was a Barry Squire thing. So there you, know. you go. Yeah. Man. Many, uh, many of the gigs that I, uh, I mean, it was it really uh, no joke was he was, uh, had a lot to do with the success of my career as working as a side man for sure. There you go. See, yeah. so so tell people because that's something that I think a lot of uh, aspiring musicians want to know. How do I get in touch with something, someone like that? And how did you? Mm -hmm. How did Barry find you, or you find Barry? Because Barry was like a connector. He wasn't a musician yep. himself, but he would connect bands, musicians. And how did that all happen? Yeah, you could kind of think of him as almost like a, a music industry professional. He worked A&R for, I think, for Columbia Records for a long time as well. But um, he had this sort of side business that maybe developed into the main thing that he did, which was he would, uh, uh, you know, if a, a management company or a record label or something, they're like, yeah, we got a band, they're going on a tour, they need a guitar player, they would call Barry. And Barry would set up a day of auditions and maybe bring down, well, it could be, it could be as simple as maybe he just refers them to five people, provides them with some names. Either that or he'd rent a rehearsal studio, set up a whole audition thing with, you know, a, a camera to videotape it and everything. And he'd show up with sheets where you write down all your information and, you know, they'd take a Polaroid photo of you and attach it to the sheet. You'd go in and do your audition and, and hope you hear back, that kind of thing. Uh, or maybe not, depending on how the vibe yeah. of the audition was. Well, a but, lot of um, times I'd see the usual suspects. I, that's how I yeah. met a couple of the guys who I later played in bands with, because I would see them on a, a few of these types of auditions, right? So how did yeah. he find you? So he found me because I got into one of his auditions through a drummer that was in a band. It was with a singer named um, Meredith Brooks. You probably remember her. Course, I'm a bitch, right? That's I right. Dance. I don't yeah. That was her hit. So, so right. she, uh, that, she was about to head out on the road and do a tour, and I knew her drummer. And the drummer said, "Hey, I can get you in on this audition." I said, "Sure." And I went down and did it, and I ended up being the like one of two or three, you know, people in the running for the gig. And I actually thought I had the gig for a minute. She called me at home and said, "Well, it looks like we're going to be doing this." And uh, you know, do you have any, you know, drug problems or alcohol problems or anything? I was like, no, I'm good, you know? And, uh, and so I thought I was going out on the road and then I heard that, you know, somebody didn't like my hair or something at the, uh, at the label, <laughs> something like that. It was, yeah, I never really got the, the story, but anyway, <laughs> they, ended, they ended up giving the gig to, uh, it was actually, uh, John five who, okay. who got the gig and then he didn't, he decided not to take it. And then they ended up going with Yogi Lonich, who ended up being my partner in crime and Chris Cornell's band. Years oh, and years. Yeah, and I know years. Yogi from so, Yogi small. from the from uh, Buck Cherry, the first incarnation of Buck Cherry as well. That's okay. right. I know. I know Yogi. Yeah, of course, man. I mean, we've known each other for years. Yep. So, th so we do have these these definite bonds. Definitely. One, yeah, it's a small world, right? But I was going to say that that's how I met Barry because Barry was organizing the majority of the audition, and he was like, well, "Who's this guy that almost got the gig that I don't?" So then we became <laughs> friends, and then he started sending me out on things. So. That's cool. I'm wondering if we've ever been on the same audition and maybe just cross paths with our either guitar cases right next to each other at, at an Probably. SIR. Yeah. Vanessa Carlton. 
That's one gig I, I actually remember from a Barry Squire call. Uh, oh, I didn't go out for that, but my friend Eric ended up playing drums with her, I think, who plays with Billy Idol now, uh, Eric Alcanius. I think he did her, I think it was Vanessa Carlton that he got the gig on drums. So I remember that, I remember it happening, like the audition. Yeah. Maybe she wasn't looking for a guitar, or, or you say you auditioned for her on guitar. I did, I did audition. So, they, so I, and there was that, that's how I ended up meeting, um, some of the people that I, I had ended up playing with in a band called Tal Bachman. And you being yeah. from Canada, I thought that perhaps maybe your name might have come up for that gig at one point because Tao was Canadian and the you know yeah. great white hope of of uh Vancouver and you what came a down great to tune, man. That hit he has she's so high. She's so high, yeah. And you played so guitar high. on that, right? I played guitar on that. Yeah, that was yeah. uh one of those that was one of those songs that uh Everybody, the the minute they heard it, they were like, "Hey, this sounds familiar." And I was like, "Yeah, the guitar riffs uh, George Harrison that I kind of borrowed from." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's a reason around. why it sounds familiar. Really cool. Everybody borrows, <laughs> <laughs> paying homage. It's I, you know, you can <laughs> borrow, paying homage. But uh, as I, I just fig feel that we had some sort of connection at, at some sort of, you know, at For some sure. point, you know, and, and it turns out that we all, we do know a lot of the same players, a lot of the same people. Yeah. Um, you've managed over the years to hang with so many credible musicians. You, you've managed to uh, record on so many different tracks of important musicians. Um, do you have any favorites before we get into your solo stuff do you have any favorites of the tracks that stand out where you go man that was a good session i'm glad i did that one and it um you know in the times that i worked with uh linda perry um you know i remember playing with like like these really i don't know about like any tracks in particular but like just whole projects that were just like a pleasure i mean i did like uh a couple tracks on the Alicia Keys "As I Am" album, and I remember being in the room, you know, playing with like just great musicians, and then Alicia playing electric piano, and you're there playing. Going, wow, I'm like, this is pretty cool right now. This, this is happening. Is yeah. and, and I remember writing like one day, like the, I don't even. This was just like a demo we were working on, but I remember I did a Courtney Love album that was um, a couple of the songs that we worked on for this record ended up on the on the last whole album. I've got three co-writes on the last. Nobody's whole. daughter, right? That was the album in 2010. Yeah, yeah, but that that was actually supposed to be a Courtney solo thing uh, initially, and we were working on it at Linda's. And at one point, it was like we recorded a bunch of tracks with Billy Corgan, and one day Billy brought in Rick Nielsen from Cheap Trick. So, like, I remember things like you know being in the studio writing a track with Rick and Courtney and Billy Corgan and Linda Perry, and going, "Okay, like I've this is cool. Like I'm yeah. totally here. I am in the studio with Rick from cheap trick and Billy. And it's just like all these, you know, and Courtney and Linda and it's people just like, that you listen to growing up and yeah. all of a sudden you're hanging on the same level. And that's, yeah. I think that's another important thing for listeners to sort of uh, maybe jot down is like, never seem like you're, you shouldn't be in the room always. If you can act like you're, you know what? I deserve to be here. There's a reason yeah. why you're in that room with those musicians and you've worked to a certain level. I mean, do you ever have to remind yourself before you go into these types of sessions? I or is it just some sort of com confidence that you might have? Already? Yeah, the confidence thing. I guess there's the act as if until thing. Like even, even if you're not feeling it, you know what it gives me like um, confidence in those situations is to remember that everybody, even the biggest rock stars, feel nervous at times or have a lack of confidence, or and you know, they this many of them have a have a good way of hiding it, or you know, they don't they don't show it. But it, but that it comes out every now and then, and to me, it's endearing when they even admit it. And I like I remember having a conversation with uh, Chris Cornell about why he liked to set up his own vocal chain in the studio, like his own mic, you know, the mic gain and the compression, and get a vocal sound together in his headphones that he liked. And he said to me, yeah, I, I hate the feeling of being on the other side of the glass and I'm not comfortable with the sound and I'm singing and I feel like I suck. And um, like, I'm, you know, the takes, it's not going well. And, and I can see the people on the other side of the glass. And mm -hmm. I, I think I start, I think, the, oh, they're talking about me and they can see that I, you know, they're, wow. and it's all falling apart in front of my eyes and stuff right. like that. He said that, and I was like, I remember saying, wow. But you, you're Chris Cornell. <laughs> yeah, you feel that way? Like, yeah at times and it, that and, and and I thought of course he feels that way cuz he's a human being and we all feel that way at times so it's important to just 
remember that everybody, you know, no matter who you are, you've you got to have your little, uh, you know, uh, ways to just sort of keep it together in those situations. And, and also just, just everybody's human, you know, so you get in that room with, uh, oh, that's a good way of looking at it. Yeah. Yeah. So I just think about that or, or I try not to think too much at all and just fall back on it. I mean, you're absolutely right. Like you're in the room for a reason. It's, it's tough at times though. I mean, I remember doing a, re uh, a session with a while ago with, uh, um, it was a number of years ago with Don Henley and right. Stan Lynch producing. Right. And they were working on a couple tunes and they called me to go to, uh, Don got had a studio forever out in Malibu. And, um, the night before the session, I said, can you come out and just work on some stuff? And I thought, that's like really, I mean, Henley's just like, you know, for me, that's just next level, right? And so I, I drove out there with an acoustic guitar and we sat around in his kind of guest house with me and Stan and and Don and they, they needed a bridge. So I, I'm like, I'm sitting there playing and I'm like, well, what if we went here and we went here and we went here? And then it sort of dawns on you at some point, like, I think I'm kind of writing with Don Henley right now. <laughs> I, I just, just some of the writers that you're that you're mentioning and you're just saying it kind of in passing but i i definitely want our listeners to understand that these are probably some of the biggest names in the business when, when you just said oh i was writing with linda perry she's written some of the biggest songs that i think yeah. you can even you know when you can think of when you think of the artists that she's sort of written for pink you know james blunt you mm -hmm. mentioned Alyssa keys so these are like i mean these are definitely a powerhouse sort of business people. Yeah. You know, the great thing about Linda that was so nice about that, because I was thinking about well, what gave me confidence in that situation. One of the great things was she fostered this, um, like she doesn't care really about like virtuosity or, uh, you know, your, your cred or she just cares about a vibe. So she's always trying to create a vibe in the studio. And one thing that was really great, working with her was that everybody's ideas as, as I got, as I got into the kind of the, the group, you know, of musicians that she was using at that time, I, I started to realize like, this is a pretty safe space. Like she will hear if you're like, Oh, oh, oh what if we went here with this chord? She's not going to go. That's not your place to say that she's going to, yeah, let's try that. And then if the drummer would be like, Hey Pete, like that thing you're playing on guitar, what if you, you know, anticipate that first note or something, as opposed to me going like, Hey man, this is I'm the guitar player. Let me worry about that or whatever. You know that would never be the, the cool in that room. It was like, yeah, yeah, sure, of course, I will, I'll try that. And then in turn, I I could say to him, hey, what about if you know that Phil, if you did more of a Ringo thing or something like that, you know? And he would right. go, of course, okay. And it was this safe space for everybody, and it it was really cool because it was like the best idea when you drop the egos and and uh, just try everybody's ideas if they're excited about things and stuff the best idea always seems to rise to the top and everybody hears it and if it wasn't your idea you'd be like oh yeah thanks for trying it didn't work that's cool let's do it that other way that you said you know and next time your idea might be the one that and when, when everybody just drops the ego and goes for it like that it's this amazing thing so linda's was always like that so i i had to think about it for a second but it's like thinking about working with linda and billy and it was always like that where it was like yeah if you're going to be in this room we're all in a like a, she's the producer, but you know, it would right. be this uh, really cool level playing field. I think it does start from that level though, because when someone like that, like I, my experience that's sort of similar is playing with Alice Cooper because mm -hmm. he's so comfortable with his uh, place, his legacy and, mm -hmm. and sort of his importance in the world of rock that he allows everybody else to shine and sort of hey come on guys come let's rise up with me and sort of you know he always gives us a, a bit of a spotlight whether it's on stage or yeah. you know or, or yeah. whether it's, it's just just hanging out and one of those things that i think we both agree on is if these people can make you feel like the most important person in the room when you're sitting with them yeah, that's isn't that the key to bringing out the most in you? Yeah, they want you to win because uh, they hired you for a reason. You know, <laughs> I, I think that's a big part of uh, you know success in any organization is you bring people on board, you hire them for their skills and abilities and stuff, and just let them do their thing. And then if you need to provide them some direction, you do that. But otherwise, kind of stay out of the out out of the way. And some of the some of the best people that I've uh, I've worked with are so great at that. Like just at uh, when it, when they wanted something a certain way, you know, Chris Cornell was definitely like that. Like he, he would say very little unless he wanted something different. And then he would be very direct about it and would be very clear. That's and great. 
Yeah, I always love that. Oh yeah, there we are in the <laughs> that gig so well, man. That was in Chile, uh, 2007, and it was hot as hell, so we got no shirts on. It was puddles <laughs> of sweat that night, but it was it was like I remember doing that tour because Chris had never actually gone to South America on any tour with Soundgarden or Audio Slave, so only as an art as a solo artist. That was his first time there. So imagine wow. those. Those fans were getting to see him for the first time. Oh man, time. they must have gone been because you know how passionate you know South South American fans are the most passionate in the, the world. Best. Yeah, it's like right? the seventies or something in America. <laughs> like, you know, they're so in it to win it, like crazy yeah, fans. Yeah. I love playing down there. Yeah. The closest I have, I think I you know who knows what Beatlemania was like. It was on a mm. different level, but the closest I think would have ever come to that was for me in ninety three playing with Gilby Clark. Uh, going down to uh, South America and doing a tour opening up uh, for Aerosmith and wow. Gilby's album when he's still in Guns N' Roses just opening uh, being released that week with the, with the single going to number one people in they, it, it was it was nuts I mean for Gilby it was like at another level even but for me it was like I was able just to be the fly on the wall to watch all this it was crazy. That must have yeah. been amazing to see those crowds for the first time down there. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. They're so, I mean, just, I don't know. It's a beautiful thing about the appreciation for art down there in general, you know, Brazil oh, and no. Chile and Argentina. The live music. Yeah. But uh, when you mentioned Don Henley, for, you know, for those mm. of you that, that might, the, the few one or two listeners that might not know Don Henley of the Eagles, um, you eventually went on to play in his touring band as well. Did that did that yeah. did that moment of writing with him and that did that turn into uh, more of a touring situation? That was years actually during that was kind of during my tenure. Uh, mm -hmm. Like so, I I got with him the fall of two thousand nine, and then I was in the touring band through twenty fifteen, and then I ended up like I think last year doing a, a gig with him, a one off. So that was cool to be able to come back. Um, so yeah, it was about five or six years of uh, you know a couple couple full tours and then a lot of sort of one offs and stuff because he was always, right. you know doing the Eagles at the same time, but he'd occasionally do uh, uh, solo runs and stuff. And that was really a, a I mean, it's kind of a career as far as being a sideman. I mean, a real like a, accomplishment or pinnacle for me. I'd originally gotten to uh, audition for his band in two thousand. And I did a, a series of auditions. It was three auditions total. And then Peter Stroud ended up getting the gig. Uh, okay. But I was like the next runner up for the gig. And he, they definitely picked Peter Stroud's a great guitar player, plays with Sheryl Crow for many years. And he's a brilliant guy. We're friends now. And, I, uh, and he definitely, Don picked the right guy because I was pretty green. I was maybe 27, 28 years old at that point. Right. And he went with the guy that had a little more experience and stuff. And, and I, yeah. and, uh, but, but years later, to nine years later, because I'd gone in for the audition in 2000 uh, and brought a, a full band of people in. I knew his musical, Don's musical director at the time, and he said, you know, Don wants to hire a whole new band. Can you bring in like a keyboard player and a drummer? And we, we want to see a bunch of young younger musicians. And I said, sure. So I put together this group of people. We all went in and auditioned. And the guy that ended up getting the gig actually out of that group I brought in was my friend Will Hollis. And um, he then went on to become Eagles MD, musical director, too. So that whole, I've always said, you owe me sushi, dude, because I brought it to that <laughs> Every too. single time I see you, you owe it to me. <laughs> Every time I see you. <laughs> exactly. So, but, so nine years later, uh, the, uh, the fellow that brought me in for that first audition, the one that called me and said, do you want to put the band together? He was actually playing with Roger Daltrey, so he was unavailable. So Will called me, the guy that I, if everybody's following this, it's a mm -hmm. complex uh, web, but Will, the keyboard player that I brought in, he called me and said, hey, do you want to come in on audition for Dawn again? And I said, sure. And I went in and did the audition, you know, nine years later, and then I got the gig. So that's um, that's the that's the definition of persistence and, you know, hanging around and not not being a jerk and, you know, not yeah. going, not going, oh, shucks, I didn't get the gig. Screw that. I'll do, you know, you hung in there. You obviously have made a living all through those years, but then you eventually get that gig. Yeah, all these years later, it came around again, and then I was ready, and it felt really good to kind of sew up that. I felt like it was a loose end that I finally, <laughs> yes, I did. It's, you know, it just feels good to lock down gigs, so, as you know. you know. <laughs> yeah, of course, man. Well, the, yeah. part of the thing is I feel that you're, you're part of this very, uh, I don't want to say hipster. I want to say credible musical sort of mafia of musicians that have the good 
really good, credible name gigs, right? But I say, I have a theory. It stems from your name because you have a very cool name, Pete Thorne. All right? <laughs> it's like, right off the bat, I think like everyone goes, Pete Thorne, I, I, I think I heard of him. Like, even when I was getting the interview, I was like going, yeah, I think, I, I think we've talked before. And it's like, no, yeah. it's because the name is rock and roll enough to be cool, but it's not too rock and roll like mine where it's all or nothing. Ryan Roxy is like, you, you're going to immediately hate me or you're kind of go, what's this guy about? It's like going on the, the Nikki Six route, right? I but, always thought it was great, man. I mean, I remember, <laughs> and it's an easy name to remember, like the double R. It's, it's like, yeah, I mean. I remember well, but it, it was, it went on one spectrum. But but Pete Thorne is inherently cool. So that, <laughs> that but, but that obviously that's not the, the reason why you've gotten all these gigs, you've gotten these gigs because you've actually worked your ass off and you've hung in there and you've subscribed to all these great beliefs that, you, you know, you, you say it, but then you practice those same beliefs. And that one of the things that you're a self-professed uh, person is a guitar geek. Right? Yeah. I mean, so, it's just doing what you love is really where it comes. So, I mean, that's going back to when I discovered the guitar and fell in love with it. And I was like, this is my thing. And if, you know, it, I guess I was lucky to find something at such a young age that I bonded with, but it's like, it always seemed like, well, why would I want to do anything else? So just follow my, you know, follow your herd or whatever, do what you love, and then you'll never work a day in your life or whatever. <laughs> it was like but I used the wrong word. I used the wrong term, not guitar geek, because you actually had the first solo album. Guitar you nerd. said it even perfectly. Guitar nerd, right? There it is. And that's and there it is. So the cover <laughs> is <laughs> me at Sears. At the photo studio when I'm 10 with my first guitar. Well, that's a Strat though, right? That's a that's a Fender Strat. That was my first guitar too. But the only a difference Hondo was. Copy, but... <laughs> well, that, Hondo, that... Hondo copy, but cheap one. Are but... you serious? A Hondo copy? Because that's a really good Hondo because it has. A... <laughs> wow. I ended up stripping all the finish off that guitar, and I found out where the arm contour is for your, you know, your your right arm. That it's all that it was like layers of plywood there. So I was like, ah. Oh. Because I wanted like to paint it like a natural cut, and then it was like awesome. No, but anyway, I, that was my. That was oh. your first a Hondo, right? Oh man! Yeah, okay. and the cover of that, I just want to say, was actually kind of a a uh, response to um because I got a you know bowl cut basically in my thick glasses and you know my and it, it's it was basically like uh, uh I found the stupidest picture I could find of myself and stuck it on the cover of my first album right. because I was so kind of. Uh, exhausted with the game of trying to do the dance or whatever in LA of trying, I mean, how many bands was I in that? I mean, you mentioned spark sparkler earlier, right? You know, when I got in that band, we were cutting a bunch of tracks and it was one of those situations where the label was maybe like, Oh, we don't hear a single or whatever go. And one of the things they did was get a different, they're like, get it, get another guitar player and add them in and add some fresh blood to the band. That was me. And then it was like, write some more songs. And and then, you know, and they were going through that kind of, uh, Oh, can we hear one more? Can we hear yeah. that? That's, that's a record. That's a record company sort of recipe for disaster. When they start emailing you or in back in those days, maybe faxing you, Hey, can we hear just one more? We'd like to, we love everything you're doing. Doing, but yeah. just one more <laughs> just one more yeah yeah and I was like, oh god you're on this endless train of kind of being so, so and somebody else is making the decisions right about like whether or not you're good enough as a band an artist whatever it is so the cover of the record was a response to all that it was really like my like hey this is the kid that i am i'm still this ge this geek on the cover uh, all these years later i just love the guitar i'm making this record for me if people like it that's cool if they don't that's okay too I'm just, I, I put the songs on there that I wanted to, you know, I wanted to put on it and I, I, I produced it myself and did it to the best of my ability with the stuff I had at the time, the songs I had, the gear I had. And did you go full Gonzo like Steve Vai style and record it in your house and do yeah. the, it, it, there you go. So yeah. That, and I know Steve Vai is a, is an influence for you as well. Yeah. And uh, he, yeah. he sort of took that, took that as inspiration and made it your own. Well, well all I, those years later, Flexible was a big, and I got to interview him recently actually on my channel. And we, we had a long talk about actually Flexible and uh, which is the Steve Vai, you know, first solo album and, and uh, how he was just doing whatever he wanted, making this weird wacky music at home and in his home studio in Silmar in like 1982. And, and then he, he put it out and long story short, that record sold, it's gone at least gold. Uh, and, you know, all, all these years later, he still owns all the rights to it. And, you know, and it's, it's an amazing. That's system. good business too. I mean, yeah. have you, 
I mean, when I look at that album cover, just so you know, when I look at Guitar Nerd, the Guitar Nerd album cover, I see a, a, a future player in Weezer. I see you, you, you just getting into the band Weezer, like without even having to audition. You're, you're there, man. Yeah, it could have. <laughs> you're a walk on. Like I guess it could have been like, well, this is, yeah, like in a reverse sort of way. I guess it could be the cool look. But, but yeah, it was really my response to being like, as opposed to taking the coolest, you know, going out on the train tracks and taking the coolest rock and roll picture I could with the coolest outfit I had on it. It was like, no, nah, let's stick this on the cover. So the, you I already got the name my- Keith Thorne. <laughs> I remember calling my mom and going, do you remember those pictures we took at Sears? Remember when I took my guitar? It's like, do you know where those are? And she's like, oh, yeah, she had them. I, I think I do, actually. And I was like, can you track that down? And she sent me the, you know, like an eight by ten of that. And I was like, this wow. is perfect. This is the That's cover. great. So. Well, I mean, stemming from stemming from being a guitar nerd, because you are a bona fide guitar nerd, and, and you've been able to sort of build an entire uh, I guess supplementary career, supplementary career out of doing sort of gear testing and doing, and that's yeah. part of what your YouTube channel uh, sort of offers, as well as, as obviously interviews, great interviews by the way that you have with Steve Vai, and I said, and and you have also uh, your own tips of you know how to hang in the music business, but a lot of the stuff that you're doing is uh, doing some gear testing. How for the people listening out there, because I know there's a lot of people that want to do that type of stuff. They want to make a living making, you know, making music or being part of that music world. How did the whole gear testing thing come around for you? And and do you find it a successful sort of side thing and maybe someday becoming even bigger? Well, it was a, it was a happy accident, um, I guess. And it's like I always tell people now, like when they're thinking about doing YouTube or, you know, th- developing a channel or anything. It's like, have an idea, you know, have a, uh, and I, I didn't really have a clear cut idea, but it was just the thing that was most natural. Uh, what, what, like, so in other words, don't do what I do. Uh, it would be my <laughs> number one, like come up with your own angle on it. If it is about gear, come up with something that's a little bit different than what I'm doing and make it something that people haven't seen before. Um, right. But yeah, there's me in my studio back in like probably like 2014 or something. Uh, I'm working on getting that hair back right now. It's going to take a while. <laughs> I just um, got all mine off, man. I, I said, we're going to be stuck indoors for, for a while. I might as well just, you know, give my, uh, give my wife a break. So she's, you know, she runs her fingers through my hair. It doesn't go. <laughs> so, yeah, I just cut it all off. It's all good for now. So but you know, the gear, like it, it started in, t- t- uh, I, I'd gotten a little home studio together with a simple interface and a couple of mics. And I did, you know, this YouTube thing and it started, it was like 2005 or six when I started my channel and I didn't know what to do with it, but I thought, well, I can record a couple of like, uh, you know, guitar lessons maybe, but there was already some people doing that. And then it was like, I don't know, let's, let's throw the mics up on the amp and see if we can make it sound good. And then I'll just record some, you know, cause I'm excited about that, you know? So, so I, uh, I, I did that. And one of the things I did was I'd just gotten an amp from a company called um, Sir Guitars and Amps, which is my, I've, I've got a long association with them now in relationship. Right. But at that point, I was just getting to know them. And they'd given me a good artist price on this little cool little 18 watt amp um, that was called a Badger. And it had just come out. And, and I thought, what could I do to thank them for, for this? You know, I thought, well, I got this YouTube channel. Maybe I'll just like record it and talk about it a little bit and then see, you know, just be like a little bit of like, Hey, I just got this great new amp. Check it out. You know, here's, here's what it does. This is what it sounds like. Put it up on the channel. And so I did that and I just played some simple, like, you know, Bowie riffs and ZZ top and stuff through it. And then I talked about the features and I recorded it well with a ribbon mic and a 57 and, and put, put that out. A couple months later, they contacted me and they said, hey, we, we wanted to thank you for that video you made. We've heard from our dealers because they, they keep in mind, they're like a small boutique company, really. Mm-hmm. And they don't you know, they're not in every guitar center everywhere. It's more like a small operation. So they built the first production run amps was 200. And they said, yeah, we sold all 200 amps uh, to Damn. the dealers. And and a lot of the dealers are talking about this video that you made uh, as, a, you know, the, a real positive like that, you know, people get to hear the thing if they're in Des Moines, Iowa, and they maybe need to order it through the mail or something. They know what the thing is going to sound like before they get it because they were right. able to watch your video. And I thought like a light bulb went off. I was like, hmm, there's something like to this. Yeah. Well, and yeah. it kind of went from there and I started doing it for, you know, a bunch of, for boss and then a bunch of smaller companies. And it's interesting because it could be a, a guy making a pedal in his garage in Greece or it right. could be boss, you know, a great big company. Uh, yeah. and, 
and, and it's just kind of the way the world's gone at this point, I think, as print media has become kind of less of a thing and reviews in guitar magazines of products and things, it, uh, people want a more kind of like, you know, interactive kind of approach where they can, you know, watch a video and then comment on it, or they can, you know, you can keep coming back to it and, and right. refer to it. Uh, and you can actually hear what something sounds like, as opposed to like a, you know, the old, I remember growing up reading Guitar Player and reading the product reviews, but you didn't really, you know, you were trying to discern what something sounded like from reading a review. Well, you know, now you can be very interactive with it. I, I think people really turn on to your authenticity about it because they know that you've been a guy that's been in that studio uh, setting. You have your own home studio. You've made tons of solo. You've you know made tons of records, and you've made your own solo solo albums. And the most, I guess, the most credible thing about your uh, whole approach is that you go on saying that you will not play something that you don't yourself really believe is good. So there yeah. is a trust factor that people have with you. And, and obviously 189,000 and counting YouTube followers, uh, you know, that's what they back. Yeah. I, 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 I won't do it if I don't feel like, like I'll never go on there and play through something and go, yeah, this is really cool. If I'm not feeling it, if I'm like, actually, I don't think this is cool, but I'm just doing it to, you know, then that's, then I've shot my whole thing to hell, you know? So basically it's gotta be, I plug it in and I can get at least a sound that I think is really good, you know, all the way to like, wow, this is exceptional. And if I do that, then I keep it honest, you know? And, and it's funny because the main thing that I do in my videos is they always start with a piece of music. Because if you look at YouTube demographics, it's like people have short attention spans these days. They, you know, yeah. you click on a video and they, they, rarely do people watch the whole thing. If you can keep somebody for the whole thing, wow, you've really made a great video. So I, I always think like, well, if, if I can hold them for 60 seconds or a minute and a half and I put a piece of music at the beginning, at least they've heard what the thing sounds like. They don't necessarily want to stay around to hear me talk about it. If they do, right. that's great. But so, so my whole thing was it's like, huh, if I do this, I can make the whole focus on the music and kind of on this piece of music that uses the gear. So say I plug in a delay pedal and it's a tape delay and it's got distinctive kind of dirty, you know, the repeats of the delay have a distinct sound. I'll try and, you know, write a piece. Come up with a riff. That yeah. That, that, that really should. So, so all I'm doing is plugging. It's, it's this fun way that I've, uh, what I'm getting at. It's a fun way for me to just write little songs and hey. it's like the video is secondary to me at that point. Like I'll just <laughs> turn on the camera. When, like I'm sitting there, I'm writing, plug it, and it, with the only framework being okay. I gotta get, I gotta use this pedal for my song. So but right. let's see what I come up with. I plug it in, and turn the knobs, and it's like, oh, that sounds cool. That sounds good. And I forget about the video. It's just like, and then I get some drums going and stuff, and then it's like, okay, yeah, now I gotta turn the camera on. Turn the camera on, and then I'll do a take. And then I maybe do another overdub layer. Oh yeah, I got to turn the camera. I'll turn the camera and do a take. So I'm, I, I, it's like I feel like I fooled people <laughs> into thinking <laughs> I'm, making, I'm making a gear video when all I'm doing is writing little songs. And having well, fun. let me ask you this: Has any of these gear review videos ever turned these riffs ever turned up on one of your solo albums? Or yeah, yeah. Oh, really? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the second album was all I, I. I mean, they're demos, they're gear demos, but they're also song demos. So I actually. Um, like the song in good company uh, is a good example. If anybody was to go listen to I think it was the Bogner Lindhurst compressor was where the song in good company came from. So you could look on YouTube for Bogner Lindhurst compressor and you, you can see the demo of that song essentially. With awesome, Bogner. man. See yeah. that that's, that's great. And, and I like your idea of putting music first. And for those people that are possibly thinking about doing their own sort of YouTube gear videos, that's a good tip. Hey, hit him over the head with music. Less first. talk and more. Yeah, show me what the thing sounds like, you know. And then it's like, and th and then you've wet their appetite. Maybe then they want to hear you. Okay, this here's the here's the tone control and whatever. But if you start and you talk about the stuff, it always seems to be like, all right, I want to hear what the thing sounds like. You know? It's and it, it's just fun. I don't. Know, it, ma it made it more fun, like making it about like writing little songs uh, and less about I'm going to make a video. That's like keep the focus on the music. I think that's the part of the like. I guess, you know, whatever success I've had, or it's just, the, it's the enthusiasm for me, for the, for the music, you know, that, right. that keeps it. Yeah. Well, I, I wanted to do something. I wanted to, because we've been talking about gear and we've been talking about music. Bef um, I want to talk about, or I want to bring on someone that's on our team that works for the show, but is also, uh, 
very inspired by you and he actually helped get this interview together. And I, I think he okay. might have a question. Um, it could be gear related, could be music related, but I want to bring on Robbie Miller. Uh, Vic, can you bring him on? There you go. So that's hey, Robbie. He, hey, man. He, he's a fellow Canadian, uh, <laughs> but he's not really, he's a Brit, but he's living in Canada. But uh, Robbie, take it away. Do you have some questions for um, Pete? Well, yeah, I mean, it's I'm I've always uh, in, enjoyed watching your your YouTube channel, Pete, and it's very inspiring. But I think what the inspiring thing for me is, and and I'm sure other people out there as well, is that I feel like as musicians we can fall into the trap of I have to commit to one thing, like I have to be a songwriter, mm. and if I focus on anything else, I'm not really doing that justice, or I have to just be a side man or a hired gun. Yeah on anything else but you've decided no i'm going to do all of these things because i really enjoy doing all of these things and you've yeah. diversified your your uh, exposure or your your the work or your passions and i just wondered is that something that you know looking back on however many years now you're like wow i really did diversify everything or did you learn that from someone did someone say hey Pete, you're good at this and this and this you need to go and do this yeah, um, I actually did a video on this. It's on my a playlist on my channel. Uh, there's a playlist called So You Want to Be a Pro Musician, and they're all videos about these kinds of topics. And what the video, I believe, is called Diversity Will Get You Through Adversity or something like that. But um, if anybody cares to check it out. But ba basically what happened was when I got to L.A. and I got I went to MI for a year to GIT. And then once I graduated out of there, it, uh, it was really all about the people that I met right after that, that I kind of attribute to getting on a good path, uh, good mentors. And these were a lot of folks that, um, like I've mentioned the, the Don Hanley gig earlier, there's a friend of mine named Frank Symes. That's how I originally got my addition with Don was through, through Frank. And I knew Frank's at 91 or 92, something like that. And he was a guy that was playing at the time with Don Hanley, uh, as his musical director, playing guitar with him. He was also a, uh, got a gig just a few years after that with uh, Stevie Nicks. He played with Warren Zevon. Oh, and he was he also had just gotten a gig with Mick Jagger, did his Wandering Spirit solo album and some live gigs. So this guy was like, wow. Like, it was like he's really doing, you know, he's on a good path, great career path. Uh, so mentors like that. There was another fellow named Mark Goldenberg, amazing guitar player, but it was also a great songwriter and producer. All these people would do multiple things. They would all write, they would all play. Uh, they, they, they had solo albums out, you know, that they were putting out. They would do little gigs around town. One thing that blew me away with, with Frank was uh, I, I ended up joining an original band of his called Surreal McCoys. That was a, like my first band in LA. So at the time that he's playing with Don, doing tours with him occasionally, playing with Mick, we were doing cover gigs in Pasadena and like playing around LA where we would go for 60 bucks a, a person, you know, he'd hump the PA into the, the, you know, the club, you know, little bars that we were playing in and we'd play and do like Rolling Stone songs and stuff like that. And then we'd go and write songs together and like record them for Zoom. So we was working on all this stuff, you know, and it, and his, his uh, ability to, always deliver 100%. He was just stoked on playing guitar. He would never phone it in. Um, so uh, it was like this great mentor that even in a bar with 10 people, there was five people in the back of the bar when we started a gig. Those five people at the end of the set would be at the front of the stage going, yeah, <laughs> like five people. And he'd just be playing Hendrix and stuff and going off and just having a great time. Awesome. And he would play like that in front of five people or 10,000 people and in any situation he was in. So the fact that he would go do club little club gigs and then the next week be working with Mick or Don was, I just, it was at like great mentors, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and and I saw the kind of diversity that that these, these folks sort of, they, they just sort of bestowed that knowledge, you know, uh, Mark Goldenberg was another one that, you know, producing records, uh, writing songs, playing with Jackson Brown at the time, just doing so many different things. And I thought, that's how you do it. It seems like, you know, because I could see that like an artist like Don didn't tour all the time or Jackson didn't tour all the time. What did these guys do when they got downtime? Well, they'd take a production gig producing an artist from Australia or something. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that that sort of thing, like little, you know, oh, I'm doing this now. I'm doing that now. I got to keep busy. Got to stay, you know, like keep the hustle going. You know, I feel like a lot of people, musicians feel almost afraid to show that side hustle sometimes. Yeah, I mean, you know? <laughs> There's no shame in like taking uh, the best musicians in LA to me. I mean, they all do that. It's like, I mean, not necessarily, you know, it's one thing if you strike it huge and you're in a band that's just, 
killing it. That's, you know, if you're in, you know, you're the guitar player in Def Leppard or something, whatever. And then that's been your career for three. But how many people get to do that? Most of the people, you know, that I know are doing multiple that that are successful because because, you know, somebody could uh, t- take uh, a year off and decide, oh, I want to go on a, you know, like sabbatical or whatever, do something, you know, and then the artist that you were touring with, it's like, oh, all of a sudden you're out of a gig, you know, and then you got to and look at what's going on right now. I mean, with coronavirus and the situation has uh, created a whole different, you know, level of like, you know, I mean, amongst people that um, I've got a lot of friends that were just about to head out on tour and stuff like that. And then that's all just quashed for the, I mean, great gigs that they've got and stuff. And now it's like, what do we do? You know? So yeah. If the more that you can diversify and have, uh, <clears throat> you know, like you know, my, my buddy Tim Pierce is a master of this. He's, you know, with his, uh, you know, he's this amazing session guitar player, but also has developed this great studio guitar master class mm-hmm. that, uh, you know, basically it's, it's, t- it, I mean, it's amazing for any guitar player to sign up for and check out, but it makes him money in his sleep now. And it always will because it's this great course that's out there that you can subscribe to. And he's got a he's got a product that you know that it's it's a it's a terrific thing. He's diversified. Took a lot of, uh, I mean, the, the amount of work he put into this masterclass and building his YouTube channel to get to the point where he also assembled an email list with fifty thousand names on it, and then finally launched the masterclass after working for two years to create content. Uh, that's the kind of diversification. These are the people that I look to, you know. Uh, he's, we're not talking about somebody in the thirties or forties here either. You know, he's older and he's like at this, you know, here he is like thinking into his fifties and sixties, like, what am I going to do to, you know, to stay ahead of the game for the next. And so that I can be a professional musician, still have an income that'll provide for me, you know, so that I can live the way I want to live. So it's brilliant. You know, that's awesome. These are the people I'm really drawn to, you know, the, diversity through adversity. I like the way you yeah. say you put that, you know, and yeah, uh, diversity will help you to, to, to avoid adversity. Yeah. There is that it uh, there. Yeah. Diversity, diversity will help you through adversity. adversity. That's right. Yeah. And that's the, uh, I mean, hopefully there's some interesting stuff in there that, you know, through these times that, Cause it's tough on musicians right now. I mean, to the, the prospect of like, uh, when is a gig going to happen again? <laughs> Who the well, hell you were, you were saying you had a lot of friends that were headed out on tour. Yeah. I, I was one of them and I'm sure that you, you were one of them as well. You probably had some, some gigs all lined up that might've been the new trigger word for musicians postponed this year, but we have to look at the positives of it because at this point, there's a lot of people that have some time to listen to interviews like this and hopefully spark ideas and, and uh, sort of inspiration inside themselves so that they can do their things. Because already, yep. just by listening to the two of you talk, I was saying, oh, well, there's some more coincidences that I didn't or some more things that, that we do have similar with our careers. Sure. That, and I didn't know you going into this conversation, but now I, I feel like I do know you a lot better hearing about your you know, your path and being in the trenches for as many years. We both went to GIT. Uh, you know, I, I went back in the 83 or something. I was like, it was like right when I got out of high school, I went down there. It was still on Hollywood Boulevard. It was yeah. the year that like, uh, I think Frank Gambali was one of the students, not a teacher at that point. Wow. He was a student there. And uh, so I, I went kind of old school style. And I always say cool. exactly what you said. The people that I met out of that right after really helped me with my um, sort of career. And it wasn't so much technically learning the instrument. What it did is instill good practice habits in me Mm -hmm. and associated me with a lot of people that wanted to learn and become uh, professional musicians themselves. So that's cool. yeah, that's cool that you mentioned that. I mean, cause it could go different way, right? Like you, here you are in LA, you're young. And I always thought like, man, I, I was lucky to meet the folks that I did because it was like good mentors and good people to get me on a good path because you never know, like, I'm going to met some... When I was talking about Rick earlier, saying, oh, there's a lot of guys in LA that grumble a lot about how tough it is and this kind of thing. And then and then even worse, you know, maybe you go down a path of like, I don't know, I was just glad that I didn't fall into some sort of dark... <laughs> thing well, yeah. it, i mean I, I looked i definitely looked over i saw i saw the abyss you know yeah. a, a, a few times and i had a, a couple of friends of mine that that actually did go you know we all went to git together that didn't uh make it out of of some of those traps but uh there yeah. are a lot of people that did and um that's what i sort of 
you know, that's just one of those similarities. The other thing I was thinking about is that I thought about it for a second. I said, we have both played uh, with Dons in the Eagles. I've just played with a different Don. Uh, you know, I played with Don Felder and you play with Don Henley, but I bet you we both played and my, my stint wasn't as long. It was just a, it was a very short stint, but I did get to do a duet of, uh, um, hotel California, which I'm sure you got to play as well. Right. Yeah, yeah. Always <laughs> crazy about that song with one of the people that originally did it, right? <laughs> yeah, I still pinch myself thinking, man, I actually got to be an eagle for a second, you know. But you got to be you, you got to be an eagle or a, a I guess what you say, sub eagle, um, for for many uh for for many many tours. So when you, you play I, that song with him there, or like Don Felder, Don Hanley, you know, you play that song. I, I, Don would. Uh, Actually, the last time I did it with him, which was last year, he played drums, which was the first time I got to back when I was touring with him. He never played drums, uh, but now he started to play drums a bit, a bit. Just more. like that, just like the video when he's playing the drums and did his, his beard automatically form. And Unfortunately, he didn't have the hair and the whole, you know, <laughs> but he had the headset mic and the whole or the, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, the big boom mic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so that was a real thrill to get to play with him finally doing it on, on, on the kit. But when I used to tour with him and do it, he would generally, he'd, he'd sing and then he'd go back and pick up some maracas and he'd be doing the maracas while you'd be playing the guitar solo. Right, right, right. right. And it was always like, he'd be standing, I don't know what it was about the maracas, but I'd be standing there playing the solo kind of facing Stuart, <laughs> the guitar player of the band and playing the solo. And then Don's out there at the corner of my left eye shaking the maracas. And I, I just always thought, God, can't suck now that he is right there with the damn rock i want him on the drums though. I'm, I'm glad you got to play it with him on the drums as well though because yeah. you know i i to be to be able to play to you know have don felders play that that 12 string it was the 12 string that he carries around with him you know to this wow. day that white double neck That's uh cool. you know it's it was it was cool but uh Man, I, like I said, there's so much knowledge that you've bestowed upon us and uh, the in the trench in the trenches listeners. Um, I know that you have like a big legion of fans that uh, are following on your YouTube, and I hopefully that a lot of our in the trenches podcast listeners will now flock to that as well because you do have your uh, page. Is it Pete Thorne official or is it just Pete Thorne on YouTube? Yeah, I think you can just go to youtube.com slash Pete Thorne. And then uh, years ago, luckily, they let me do that. Like I, when I started my YouTube channel, I wouldn't have named it some acronym, which it was originally it was slash S-I-N-A-S-L-1, which was Stranger in a Strange Land. You know, and I, I thought YouTube was going to be. They'll get it. Yeah, they'll that. understand. <laughs> but they let me kind of pick a different URL later. And I right. and now I've got youtube.com. But only me. once. They only once. You can't change it after that. It's written in stone. But uh, yeah. but so then uh, Instagram, you're at, at Pete Thorne Guitarist, um, myself. And then that's uh, at, at uh, I think, Robbie. Are you Robbie Guitarist? Robbie Miller Guitarist? I'm Robbie on Instagram. Yeah. Robbie Rock Miller. They're Robbie Rock Miller, and I'm I'm just simply at Ryan Roxy, all or nothing. Like I said, if I, I would have just gone at Pete Thorne because it's so damn cool, but there probably was someone already at there at Pete Thorne, so you had to go Pete Thorne guitarist on Instagram. Oh, I'll tell you what happened. Yeah. I'll tell yeah. you. What. Do you want to hear the funny story? I happened. do. Okay. <laughs> I signed up for Instagram in 2013, and I was Pete Thorne. I had Pete Thorne on Instagram, and I had a kind of a jealous girlfriend at the time. And when I signed up for Instagram, I just picked, uh, do you want to make, do you want to follow all your Facebook uh, contacts? And so I said, yeah, sure. And I picked that. Right. And I didn't even know. I mean, Instagram was kind of a new thing then. Well, right. like, I, I, I was, it's never going to last. You know, it's a, it's a fad. <laughs> and I was on tour in France and I remember getting this text from my girlfriend. Well, OK, I thought that we had something special, but, you know, you just followed all of your, you know, exes and stuff like that. And I went oh, no. like, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I did not. I just picked the follow all because you know, I knew all these Facebook friends from right. years ago. So she was all pissed off. And I said, fine, you know what? I don't even need Instagram. I don't care. And I deleted it then because I was pissed off. Or whatever. Oh. We were having it. And then I tr went back a year later or whatever and tried to sign up for it again. It's like, oh, that name's already taken because I had taken it and deleted the account. Yeah. <laughs> so I screwed myself out of Pete wow. Thorne. <laughs> what, what, if, what if you could buy it from Tim Pierce? Yeah. What if Tim Pierce actually had taken that name and now he ah. has another side hustle that sells all the Instagram names that no. <laughs> <laughs> fucking great so at pete thorne guitarist i'm glad we cleared that up i'm That's still just at ryan roxy and um you know robbie rock guitar 
guitarist. Robbie Rock Miller. Sorry there, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I am guitarist on other media. Accounts. Your parents middle, middle named you Rock, so you know yeah, that yeah. makes sense. <laughs> I wish. I wish they did. <laughs> oh man so pete it's been a thrill having you on um i i really uh, appreciate you being in the trenches uh i thank, you thank know you. like i said w hang, hang on for a second while i uh say goodbye to the guests and uh we'll, we'll talk in a second but uh folks out there listening make sure you follow, follow pete thorne we just went through the whole instagram drama of why you should but just go to at Pete Thorne on YouTube, and you can see a lot of uh, important, influential videos. Uh, it's been, and of course, check out the solo albums as well. Um, of, of course, we have uh, Guitar Nerd, but also just recently, Pete Thorne, Roman numeral two. We have to talk about the Pete Thorne two because that's that's your latest solo album, yes? Yeah, uh, I guess it's been two years out. So, it's, God, it's time to get another one done, I guess. But, um, yeah, and this one was done in similar fashion, just me making it kind of on my own. I mean, luckily, every drummer in town's got own, their own great studio now, it seems like. So I was able to do, you know, some great drums of some good, good friends in their studios. But otherwise, it was all cut by me at, at, in my place and mixed uh, at my place. And it's just another, uh, just a continuation. You know, if you like solo guitar, right. you know, uh, rock and roll and... Uh, such things then uh well, check it out please i guess it's time to start doing some more product uh reviews so you can come up with material for the third so <laughs> right. oh, i'm already there i got it i got it <laughs> in the can okay cool well then we'll look forward to the to the next one coming out but for the time being guitar nerd pete thorne three two and uh thank you again for for uh, coming on and everybody else until next time we will see you in the trenches thank you so much Trenches with Ryan Roxy.